to the coronary arteries, to be precise, the lining of the coronary arteries is controlled from the right side of the cerebral cortex, just above the right ear. And what we always want to keep, also, also want to keep in mind, is that the coronary arteries pump blood to the heart. So the conflict linked to the coronary arteries is a territorial loss conflict. So the biological concept of a territory refers for us to the space and to the environment in which we live. So to our domain, for example, our private domain or our professional domain. So we can experience a loss of our private domain through the loss of our home, for example, or because of a divorce, because of an unexpected move the confiscation of the property, fire, flooding, anything that threatens the safety of the place where we live. The loss of a, prof the, uh, of a professional domain can relate to the loss of a business, to the loss of a workplace, because of layoffs, because of a merger, downsizing, a transfer, an unwelcomed retirement, let's say because of illness or because of cutbacks. But the members of our domain, so our spouse, our partner, our children, our parents, our pets, our friends, colleagues, clients, customers, also belong to our territory. So we can suffer a territorial loss when we lose a member of the pack through death, for example, or a separation, or because of a disagreement or of an argument. Components of our domain also belong to the territory. So this can relate to anything that is of personal value. This could be a car, it could be a computer, it could be a piece of jewelry, an immigrant status, a driver's license, a flying license, anything that is important for us and which we consider as part of our domain or territory. So when we suffer such a territorial loss conflict and have such a DHS, the program is instantly set into motion. And this is what happens. The moment we experience a territorial loss conflict, the conflict impacts in the area of the brain that controls the coronary arteries. And in that instant, or at that instance, the lining of the coronary arteries start to ulcerate, causing tissue loss. And the biological purpose of the tissue loss is to widen the coronary arteries so that more blood per minute can be pumped to the heart so that the individual has more energy and more vigor to get the territory back and to establish a new one. So we see nature always helps out, and this is what I explained before also, this is to, in order to facilitate a conflict resolution. So it is the ulceration in the arterial wall that causes angina pectoris. So it is this ulceration that causes angina pectoris. Angina pectoris is stabbing heart pains. Typically, these heart pains, they radiate into the shoulder, into the neck, the jaw, and down the arm. So uh, the intensity, of course, of the angina pain is now proportional to the conflict intensity. So I repeat this so we see the system again. The conflict intensity is determined by how intensely we subjectively experience the shock. And it is this in, uh, intensity that determines the magnitude of the impact in the correlating brain area. This in turn 
person sends the signal to the coronary arteries, do something about it, help me, help me, help me, and the ulceration process is initiated, widening these uh, coronary arteries for the reason to get more uh, uh, blood to the heart. And this causes, of course, this process causes, uh, in this case, pain, which is angina pectoris. So what we want to keep in mind is that angina pectoris is a symptom of the conflict active phase. And as soon as the conflict is resolved, this ulceration process instantly stops. During the healing phase now, this arterial wall, the ulceration in the arterial wall is now refilled and replenished and goes through a restoration process. And there's a very specific substance that is ideal for repairing and restoring blood vessel walls, which is cholesterol. So cholesterol is mainly or predominantly produced in the liver. In fact, 80% of the total cholesterol is synthesized within the body. Only 20% come from our diet or from dietary sources. And the liver uh, uses uh, 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 the fats or the fats from our diet, particularly unprocessed fat, for, uh, as raw material to manufacture cholesterol. And the liver will uh, manufacture or produce as much as cas col uh, cholesterol as required for repairing the blood vessel wall. And the so-called LDL cholesterol, labeled by conventional medicine as the bad cholesterol, is particularly useful because LDL cholesterol is very sticky and, there's, and this, uh, therefore ideal for doing or repairing the blood vessel wall. So naturally, during the healing phase, the cholesterol level rises. So during the healing phase, the cholesterol level rises naturally in order to have uh, the material, so to speak, ready to fix and to repair and to restore the blood vessel wall and to correct the ulceration and the tissue loss that occurred during the conflict active phase. So during the healing phase, the cholesterol level rises. But the high cholesterol level, my friends, is never ever a reason to panic. As Dr. Ron Rossdale explains in the book, The Cholesterol Myth. And here's a quote. Cholesterol, so he says correctly, is important for cardiovascular health. Cholesterol is a necessary ingredient in any sort of cellular repair. This means that, cholesterol, that the cholesterol level can be elevated with any kind of healing. So the cholesterol can, uh, level can be elevated during any kind of healing process. Hence, as Dr. Hammer says, making a link between elevated cholesterol and the onset of a heart attack is, funda is a fundamental error in scientific reasoning. And again, Dr. Rossdale, medicine gives the impression that the liver produces cholesterol for the prime purpose of giving you a heart attack. Evolution doesn't work this way. Nature doesn't work this way. The concept that chemicals in our body give us diseases is absurd. This truly speaks the, the language of German new medicine. So if it is not cholesterol plaque, if it's not the occlusion of the coronary artery, what then causes the heart attack? Well, I want to say something before about atherosclerosis. Yes, very important. So, uh, yes, so during the healing phase, the cholesterol rises in order to uh, repair the blood vessel wall. But uh, if this healing phase is constantly interrupted by conflict relapses, then the repetitive and ongoing repair of the blood vessel wall causes cholesterol deposits in the uh, blood vessel wall, which in turn uh, causes atherosclerosis. 
but the plaque in the cholesterol, in the, in the uh, uh, heart vessel, in the coronary arteries can never ever cause a heart attack because um, in case of in the emergency situation that such a, 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 a blood vessel would uh, occlude auxiliary vessels or so-called collaterals are already in place in order to supply the heart with blood. And this has been uh, uh, confirmed by medical science. And this is a very important uh, contribution here. A study by Renthrop et al. in the April 1988 issue of the American Journal of Cardiology has produced results completely at odds with the coronary artery blockage theory. In an accompanying editorial, Dr. Stephen Epstein of the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute summarizes Rentrop and colleagues' extremely important observations. They found that in advanced state of the narrowing of the coronary arteries, the supply of blood to the heart muscle is fully assured via collaterals that enlarge naturally in response to the blockage. Interestingly, they observed that the more the coronaries are, are narrow, the less danger there is of a heart infarction. So this also means, my, friend, my friends, that the theory that heart attacks are caused by heart blood pressure, high blood pressure, is also invalid because the theory suggests that high blood pressure damages the coronary arteries, which in turn causes the heart attack. So we, I will speak later about heart attacks and uh, uh, high blood pressure, but we have to more say one more thing, because the fact that collaterals take over this blood supply in case of a narrowing of the coronary arteries also questions the necessity of bypass operations. And here I have a quote. This was in the Business Week online uh, in 2006, way back. Bypass, that bypass operation. Is heart surgery worth it? Physicians are questioning whether bypass it and angioplasties necessarily prolong patients' lives. The data from clinical trials are clear. Except in a minority of patients with severe disease, bypass operations don't prolong life or prevent further heart attacks. And uh, underline this so we remember that. Bypass operations do not prevent further heart attacks, nor does angioplasty in which narrowed vessels are expanded and then typically propped open with metal tubes called stents. People often believe that having these procedures fixes the problem as if a plumber came in and fixed the plumbing with a new piece of pipe, explains Dr. David Hills, professor of cardiology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. But it fundamentally does not fix the problem. So if it is not cholesterol plaque, if it is not the occlusion of a coronary artery, what then causes the onset of a heart attack? And Dr. Hammer discovered that the heart attack is actually initiated in the brain. And this is what he says. Concerning heart attacks, we have failed to recognize the significant role of the brain just as we overlooked the important role of the brain in cancer. So let's look now at the details. So we are going to look now at the brain level and see what happens on the brain level parallel to the healing on the organ level, so parallel to the healing of the coronary arteries, as we learned through cholesterol. So while the coronary arteries are repaired and fixed with the help of cholesterol, this is what I'm going to explain now, ha going to happen or happens at the same time on the brain level. Well, healing, as I explained before, always occurs in a fluid environment. So during phase A of healing, uh, serous fluid is, and uh, yeah, serous fluid as you call it, is drawn to the area that is healing at the time. 
in the brain, this accumulation of fluid uh, the, um, creates a so-called brain edema, which is basically a water cushion that protects the area while healing runs its course. The size, here we have a, a, a brain scan that shows such a water pocket. Right here on the brain scan, uh, edema shows as dark, right? And this is in the area that controls the coronary artery, so an authentical brain scan. So the size of the brain edema is now determined by the magnitude of the impact of the shock in the brain when the uh, uh, conflict, when the DHS took place. So during phase A, there is a brain edema that develops in the area of the brain that controls the coronary arteries. Okay? Uh, now at the height of the healing phase, a, signic a significant event takes place. And this is what happens. At the height of the healing phase, the entire organism is all of a sudden pulled out of the vagoternic state and put back into a conflict active state of stress with nervousness and restlessness, nausea, cold sweats, which are all typical symptoms of the conflict active phase and also, as we will see, symptoms of a heart attack. So the entire organism is pulled out of the vagotonic state and put back into a conflict active state of stress. So what is the purpose of that? Well, at the height of the healing phase, this brain edema has reached its maximum size. And exactly at this moment, this sympathicotonic stress push presses the edema out. And this is a significant counter-regulation because without this turning point, or the only after this turning point, can the organism go back to normal. And this sympathicotonic stress push also um, uh, expels the brain, brain edema, as I said, which relieves the brain pressure, which is, of course, vital. So typical uh, uh, um, epicrisis, as we also call that, epicrisis events are, for example, or episodes are um, asthma attacks, epileptic seizures, strokes, and heart attacks. And we are going to look now in details at the heart attack. What happens? Well, in the same brain relay, that controls the coronary arteries, we have the control center that controls the slow heartbeat. Here we have the bradycardial heart rhythm center that controls the slow heartbeat. So during the epicrisis, when the brain edema is pressed out with the sympathicotonic stress push, that involves the slow heartbeat center. This is why a typical symptom of the heart attack that involves the coronary arteries is, as it's called, bradycardial arrhythmia, so the heartbeat slows down. So when the heart attack occurs, the heartbeat instantly slows down. And at the same time, we have angina because uh, the epicrisis is also an intensified reactivation of the conflict active symptoms. So together with the slow heartbeat, there, are where there is angina, so there is strong angina pain plus cramps because the coronary arteries are also endowed with muscle tissue. But these chest pain, these cramps, are not related to the myocardium, because the myocardium is, as we will see later, controlled from an entire different part of the brain. So the heart cramps, the muscle cramps, we want to keep this in mind, that they are, they are not caused by the heart muscle, yeah, contraction, but by the contraction or cramps in the lining or in the wall of the coronary vessels. Typically for a heart attack are cold sweats, nausea, which are typical symptoms of any epicrisis. During an intense heart attack or epicrisis, the person might faint. And there's also a good reason for that, 
because fainting also called absence or absence, while fainting uh, puts the person into a state of unconsciousness so that this uh, epicrisis, which is the most critical point of the biological program, will not be interrupted. So the uh, autonomous nervous system puts the body out basically so that this epicrisis is not interrupted because this is the most critical point of the entire program. And this is how Dr. Hammer uh, speaks about fainting, so to speak. We viewed the loss of consciousness uh, that occurs during the epileptoid crisis as particularly dramatic. With three to four heartbeats per minute and even very flat breathing, a person can stay alive for a long period of time, basically until the often long-lasting absence and the cerebral slowdown of the atri atrial arrhythmia is over. Okay? So the epicrisis is basically like turning a corner. It's like we have made it over the hump, so to speak. Okay, so let's see what happens afterwards. Well, after the epileptoid crisis or after the heart attack in this case, the entire organism enters phase B of the healing phase. So phase B is also called the scarif scarification phase because this is the period when scar tissue is formed in the healing area just like it happens with any wound healing. And this process also takes place in the brain. And in the brain or the brain cells whose function it is to complete the uh, repair process and healing process on the brain level are so-called glial cells. Glia is brain connective tissue that basically insulates neurons. Um, so it insulates neurons. And 80% uh, in fact of all brain cells are glia cells which shows and indicates their importance. So after the epicrisis, after this brain edema has been pressed out, glia cells accumulate at the area to complete the healing process in the conflict-related brain relay. And in this brain scan, we see the presence of glia as a white ring configuration. So here we see the presence of glia. Glia appears on a brain scan as white. In conventional medicine, such glia accumulation is diagnosed as a brain tumor, typically as a glioblastoma. This is actually a correct term. Glioblastoma means sprouting glia cells, right? So conventional medicine diagnoses this as a brain tumor. But Dr. Hammer demonstrated already in the early 1980s that so-called brain tumors are not cancers, but a natural healing process that is going on or taking place in the brain parallel to the healing of the corresponding organ. So in this case, parallel to the healing of the coronary arteries. So while we have on the, uh, in the coronary arteries the repair process with the help of cholesterol, we have on the corresponding brain relay that controls this process also a repair phase which shows on a brain scan as the glial pockets because glial cells have the function to do that job. Right? So all, in fact, uh, indications of healing. So I would now and will tell the story to this brain scan. So this case concerns a um, former patient of Dr. Hammer. Uh, it was an elderly farmer in Germany. And he had suffered a heart attack a few weeks after his son had a serious motorcycle accident. So initially the father, so the elderly farmer, he was told that his son will most likely not survive the injury and if, then he would re remain uh, severely handicapped. 
Uh, since the son was also the sole inheritor of the farm, his father uh, um, uh, experienced the territorial loss conflict particularly as dramatic as we can see here on the brain scan. Well, and from the day of the, his son's accident, the father had angina pectoris. So he had angina pectoris starting the day when he had the territorial loss conflict. But about six months later, uh, contrary to the prognosis of the doctors, the, uh, the son was released from the hospital and a month later he was back working at the farm. And this is when his father resolved the conflict and four weeks later he had the heart attack. And this brain scan was taken a few weeks after the heart attack had taken place and we clearly see because or based on the clear uh, 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 ring here that he had passed the epicrisis and that now the coronary arteries as well as the correlating brain relay are now in healing. So with German New Medicine, heart attacks are no longer a mystery. With German New Medicine, we know why we have a symptom, why we have the symptom now, if the symptom belongs to the conflict active phase, or if the symptom is already an indication of healing and a positive sign and a confirmation that the related conflict has been resolved. And on top of it, as Dr. Hammer puts it so beautifully, if the patient has been made aware of all the facts, he will no longer need to get frightened by his symptoms. He can now fully accept these as the healing symptoms they are, all of which had until now caused fear and panic. In the greatest number of cases, the whole episode will pass without any serious consequences. Which means with this awareness, a heart attack can actually be received or perceived as a relief instead of a threat. Right? So we basically go now to the left side of the um, uh, cortex here. <clears throat> and we're going to learn now about the heart attacks related to the coronary veins. Well, first of all, we keep in mind or want to remember that the coronary veins carry blood to the lungs. The control center of the coronary veins, as I explained already, is on the left side of the cerebral cortex, just above the left ear. The conflict linked to the coronary veins is a sexual conflict. In biological terms, a sexual conflict means not being able to mate. So for us humans, this translates into sexual rejection, sexual frustrations, feeling sexually unwanted. But Dr. Hammer found, based on all uh, the work he did and all the many cases, that a sexual conflict can be experienced with any shocking experience in relation to sexuality. So this could be sexual abuse, of course, uh, rape, uh, unwanted sexual practices, anything in relation shocking with porno, finding out that uh, the partner is sleeping with somebody else, and so forth. So let's see what happens. Well, we basically have exactly the same process as we have learned what is happening here uh, uh, in the coronary arteries. We have exactly the same in relation to the coronary veins. So during the conflict active phase, there will be ulceration in the lining of the coronary veins causing angina pectoris. But Dr. Hammer says that in, in, uh, with the coronary veins, the uh, uh, angina pain is not as strong as with uh, coronary artery-related programs, but is still, of course, depending on the intensity of the conflict activity, noticeable. Well, and during the healing phase, this ulceration, so this tissue loss, is repaired and restored uh, with the help of cholesterol. But what happens now during the heart attack? So we have lots of things to learn here. 
So while the uh, slow heartbeat is controlled from uh, the right uh, side of the cerebral cortex, so the slow heartbeat is controlled from the same control center that controls the coronary arteries, the fast heartbeat is controlled from the same control center as the coronary veins. So during the epicrisis, when the sympathicotonic stress push presses the steamer out, this causes or this involves the heart rhythm center. And in this case, we have during the event a, what is called a tachycardial arrhythmia, in other words, irregular heartbeats, but in this case, heart racing, so a fast heartbeat. Okay, a fast heartbeat. So you see, it's exactly the opposite from the coronary artery-related uh, attack. So I repeat, when the cor <coughs> coronary arteries are involved, the heartbeat slows down, while when the coronary vein are involved, there is a fast heartbeat, a, f a heart is racing, um, uh, so-called tachycardia. And at the same time, we have the reactivation of the angina pain, so again, stabbing heart pains, plus cramps uh, that are caused by the muscle contraction in the wall of the coronary arteries. But there is a very distinct symptom which differs in this case from the coronary artery related heart attack, which is breathing difficulties. And here is why. As I mentioned before, the coronary veins carry blood to the lungs. So during the epicrisis, when the stress push occurs, right, and because of the contractions of the muscles in the coronary veins, healing scabs can get pulled off the coronary vein wall, are pushed into the lung circulation, blocking the lung artery and causing a lung embolism. So a lung embolism is in reality a heart attack linked to the coronary veins. Well, a lung embolism can also be caused by a thrombus, so by a blood clot that blocks the, blocks the lung artery. This is typically the case when a person has been immobile for a longer period of time, for example, after an accident or after an operation, or when the person is hospitalized or bedridden. But whether this lung embolism is caused by a coronary vein epicrisis or if it's caused by a thrombus is easily or can be easily established with the help of a brain scan. Because if the uh, um, uh, lung embolism is caused by an epicrisis eh, and originates from, in this case, a sexual conflict, we will see the alteration in the uh, uh, um, area of the brain that controls the coronary veins. Right? And at the same time, the person will have angina pain and cramps in the chest. Well, if the uh, <clears throat> lung embolism is caused by a thrombus, then we will not see anything on a brain scan because this is a, let's call it a mechanical occurrence, and the person will not have angina pain. So it's very clear if that is linked to a, 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 a biological program, which means to an original conflict, in this case a sexual conflict, and we know uh, that uh, the program ran its course, which is, I will s later talk about prevention, of course, essential if we know what the cause of the lung embolism is, if it's a mechanical one, or if it's actually caused by an emotional distressing event, right? So this brain scan, <clears throat> we also have a story for that. So this concern, or this case, is about a young lady at the time while well, young, in our perspective. She was 34 years at the time. Uh, she was uh, also a former patient of Dr. Hammer, and uh, she had suffered a sexual conflict when she learned that her best friend or that her husband had uh, slept with her best friend and that they actually had a child together. 
So when she found out that was for her, see, a sexual conflict. It's a good point to explain something else. You see, how we experience such a conflict is very subjective. In fact, when the conflict occurs, it bypasses our consciousness and our subconscious, so to speak, associates a certain danger, a biological danger, so to speak, with the association. For another woman who had found out that, you know, there is a, a, an affair and that there is actually a child uh, sh uh, her husband has with that woman, she could experience this as a self-devaluation or as an anger or as an existence conflict or as an abandonment conflict, okay? But only when we see the symptoms, then we know exactly what type of conflict took place. So in this case, the resolution was the reconciliation between the three of them, right? So the lung embolism that she had, which she had actually uh, was quite severe because, and this is the point, she was conflict active for seven months. And now this is going to take us to um, much more precious information. For us, this is just so valuable because specifically about uh, understanding what is really going on uh, in the body, how we get all these symptoms and so-called diseases so we can get to the source of it. So this is what Dr. Hammer tells us. First of all, the epicrisis, so the heart attack or the lung embolism, occurs typically two to six weeks after the conflict was resolved. Okay? So remember the farmer with the son with the motorcycle accident? He had the heart attack four weeks after the conflict resolution, so when the son was back at home working and all was well. So the epicrisis occurs two to six weeks after the conflict resolution. Well, the amount of time a person was conflict active determines the size of the brain edema and therefore the magnitude of the heart attack. Because the bigger the brain edema, eh, so when the, when the brain edema is pressed out, the bigger the, uh, the pushing, the bigger the expelling, the bigger the brain pressure. And if this is very uh, intense, this can cause a fatal heart attack. So I repeat that part, Dr. Hammer found that if the conflict activity lasted, was intense, and lasted more than nine months, then the heart attack will be fatal. So death is basically caused by the brain pressure because of the big uh, brain edema, but also by the arrest of the heartbeat because don't forget the heart rhythm centers, either one of them, depending um, where the epicrisis is, is involved. I will get back to this a little bit later with more details. So if the conflict activity was more than nine months, then the heart attack during the epicrisis will be fatal. If the conflict activity lasted about four to six months, then the heart attack will be, let's call it medium, so to speak. If it's less than four months, then it's mild. If it's very small, like a couple of months, one month, then the heart attack will not even be noticed. Okay? So this takes us now, my friends, to prevention. Because the heart attack or the coronary artery in coronary vein programs are one of the few biological programs where there's actually pain during the conflict active phase. In this case, angina pain. And this is actually a good thing. Because if we are conflict active, which means we can't sleep, we can't eat, we are nauseous, we are completely preoccupied with the conflict, so typical conflict activity have cold hands, okay? So if we are conflict active as a result of a DHS and have at the same time angina pectoris, 
that indicates, or this indicates, that we are conflict active with one of the two biological programs. So either with a territorial loss conflict or with a sexual conflict. And with knowing that the epicrisis, so the heart attack, or the intensity of the heart attack is determined by the duration of the conflict active phase, we also know that the sooner we resolve the conflict, the less serious will be the heart attack. And if we manage to resolve the conflict within four months or even earlier, the, the heart attack might not even be noticed. So I often get the question, so how do we resolve conflicts? Well, there is no general answer with German New Medicine. The reason is because every situation is an individual situation with individual circumstances. So we have to sit down, look at the exact situation, and only the person knows, of course, with our support, what the best way would be to resolve this particular situation. Dr. Hammer always points out that a practical solution is always the best because it is most lasting. However, if we, are, if we cannot resolve the conflict at the time because of constraints, then we want to try to find a partial resolution to the conflict. In German New Medicine, we call this downgrading a conflict. So downgrading means we find partial resolutions to the conflict. We also can downgrade a conflict by talking about the conflict <clears throat> with a friend or with a therapist. We can downgrade the conflict by distraction, so anything that clears the mind. We can also downgrade the conflict by, yeah, by putting things in perspective, by looking at the conflict situation from a different angle, by changing our attitude, by uh, seeing the larger picture. Okay? So communicating, trying to understand the person or the people who are involved, forgiveness. This, my friends, is real prevention because we cannot prevent conflicts from occurring. For example, the painful loss of a loved one, a separation, or ending without a job. But we have a say in how we view that situation. So we can, uh, by uh, changing our attitude, so we have a say in how we view the situation. Conflicts are an essential part of life. This is, my friends, why we are here to begin with. So we can um, learn and advance spiritually while we heal emotionally. Well, let's look a little bit further because this downgrading, so downgrading the conflict on the emotional level has a wonderful effect effect because the psyche, the brain and the organ, as we learn, always work as a unit, always work in synchronicity. So on the organ level, downgrading means that now the ulceration process also slows down. So consequently, the brain edema that develops during the first phase of healing will also be smaller or uh, significantly smaller and the heart attack or the epicrisis minor. And this is prevention. So we're going, in terminal medicine, we concentrate fully on the emotional and mental level because it is the psyche where diseases originate. So it is the psyche where diseases begin to heal. Okay. So now I would like to say more about this nine months uh, period here. Because Dr. Dominus is very important. If the conflict activity, as I said before, lasts for more than nine months, then the heart attack will be fatal. So Dr. Hammer strongly <coughs> advises, if a person has been conflict active for more than nine months, then the person should not resolve the conflict. Because in this case, it, it would follow a, a fatal heart attack or lung embolism. 
So rushing into clearing conflicts, as it is fashionable in some of today's uh, modalities, can have serious consequences. Okay? So we want to keep in mind that we should not intentionally resolve the conflict. So if somebody had a territorial loss because he lost his wife, the worst thing to do is set him up on a blind date. Okay? So if the conflict activity is long and this is serious, we want to make sure that we do not rush into a conflict resolution in order to prevent a fatal heart attack. Well, with German New Medicine and with Dr. Hammer's work, we also learn that uh, a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle are, of course, important to uh, keep the organism strong and keep us in good shape. But we also recognize that a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle do not relate to heart attacks because heart attacks originate in the psyche as a result of a conflict shock and an emotionally distressful event, and heart attacks are really initiated in the brain during the healing phase of the related conflict. And this process cannot be influenced, of course, with diet or anything of what we think we can do about it. We have to concentrate on the emotional level and also recognize that these biological programs are meaningful biological programs in order to help us. Because preceding this heart attack was angina, yes, but angina is caused by widening the coronary arteries in order to supply the blood, the heart with more blood, so we have a chance to get, in this case, the territory back and to resolve the conflict. So based on Dr. Hammer's work, we also recognize that there is no genetic link to heart attacks either. Because heart attacks originate in a conflict situation that occurs in the here and now and only, and uh, 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 only involve, or exclusively I want to say, involve the person who is suffering or who is experiencing that conflict at the time. So it involves a, a single person, one person in the here and now, and also this brain that receives the conflict shock, sends the signal to the corresponding organ, which in turn responds with a meaningful process in order to help us through the crisis. Okay? So no link to genetic factors, so to speak. So concepts that suggest that current diseases are originate in conflicts of our ancestors, okay? <laughs> so this concept that current diseases originate in uh, conflicts of our ancestors, as it's proposed by uh, representatives, for example, of the transgenerational therapy or total biology or uh, Bert Hellinger's uh, uh, family constellations, well, these concepts also miss the point because as we know, diseases or heart attacks or any of these symptoms uh, uh, originate in the individual psyche of one particular person and has nothing to do with our ancestors. They had their own conflicts in their own body, in their own brain that sends a signal to the body to help out. So in other words, this view is also still locked in the old medical paradigm of that diseases are malignancies and dysfunctions of the human body. So blaming our environment or our food or our ancestors doesn't get us anywhere. Okay? We have to start looking at ourselves. We have to start looking inside ourselves and face the conflicts that we experience in our lives. Because I always like to say and repeat this, okay? it is in the psyche where diseases originate. So it's in the psyche where diseases begin to heal. So prevention can only start inside ourselves and within us. Right? And we're finally, Dr. Hammer uh, brings order into the theory chaos of conventional medicine. 
And again, it's not another theory, it's not an alternative medicine. It is a uh, new medicine that is based on natural laws and principles we humans share with all living organisms, including plants. Today, I don't have the time to talk about the conflict shock of plants. Well, if you know the book by um, um, Christopher Bird, The Secret Life of Plants, this would not be a surprise that, of course, plants also experience biological conflict shocks. Just look at acid rain, look at the leaves, and you see the nice ring configuration on the leaves. But now we have to continue with the heart, <laughs> which is nice too. Okay, so for the, for in the first part, I uh, talked about the heart attacks related to the coronary arteries and the coronary veins. So basically, uh, the essence of my presentation is that we learn to differentiate between the different type of heart attacks because the conventional theory says, well, uh, cholesterol plaque in the coronary arteries block the blood supply to the heart. No, uh, the heart muscle doesn't get enough oxygen causing a heart attack. So it's basically a messy thing, right? So conventional medicine only looks at the function of the heart, of the anatomy of the heart, and makes conclusions from there. And I was not trying to be ironic when I said that this is academic fiction because we have to work with, with empirical data and not start interpreting. Okay? So, of course, a lot of research is correct, as I said in this example, that there are the coronary, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cholesterol plaque uh, in the coronary arteries, but make conclusions that this causes a heart attack that is incorrect because there are too many exceptions. And in science, the rules are very clear. If there is one exception to the theory, the theory is invalid. That's it. Okay? So we have to be very precise because this is about our health. This is about us. This is about our lives. So we have to rely on what we're learning. Right? And this is why Dr. Hammer's work is such a gift to us, because not only do we learn to understand uh, the nature of diseases and their causes, we also learn that we don't have to be afraid of diseases, that we don't have to panic, because based on the new medical paradigm, diseases are emergency programs. So if we are in an emergency situation, that we have a death fright, or we have a starvation conflict, in our terms, we have no food because we lost our job, and so forth, that our brain and every body cell is programmed by nature to help us to survive. It cannot be any other way. Because if our body were designed to destroy itself through all sorts of diseases, we wouldn't be sitting here. Okay? This is all about survival.